what portfolio of TED Talks can go without the ultimate weapon, a man named Ted, Ted Sellers. Ted Sellers is our professor of environmental exposure science. Um, he, not only is he an expert in microsystems for chemical measurement of environmental exposures, he's also one of our best teachers and last year won the Teacher of the Year Award for the entire school. And I remember when putting together the, uh, the award packet reading one comment of a student who said something like, uh, a year later after graduating, when the terror of taking his class finally <laughs> faded away, I realized I learned more from it than any other class in the school. Please welcome Ted Zeller. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about exposure science for the next few minutes. Now, we've heard the term exposure science uh, used a few times today, actually not that much, and rather offhandedly, but it's only recently that it's made its way into the lexicon of environmental health sciences and sort of uh, gain traction in the collective uh, consciousness of academics and uh, professionals and regulatory agencies and funding agencies and even the general public. And it's not just a term, but it's being used as a sort of a unifying concept or a theme to try to draw upon and draw together the disciplines that we conventionally use to define environmental health sciences. Toxicology, industrial hygiene, epidemiology, environmental science, nutrition, and risk. These are the conventional disciplines. And as conventional disciplines often do, they create societies and associations, uh, at least a few journals, and they have annual conferences where they share research findings and, uh, and new ideas, and they push the agenda for the discipline forward. And well, recently now, we have an international society for exposure science. We have a journal where exposure science figures prominently in the title, and now there's an annual conference with uh, attendances that are actually growing by leaps and bounds every year, concerned specifically with exposure science. And this organization has a mission statement that really represents the diversity of all the disciplines that I just mentioned. So actually, I think what we're seeing is that there's a renaissance underway in how we view exposure how we try to discover, understand, characterize, control, ultimately eliminate those critical exposures occurring in the vast array of environmental stressors to which we're exposed as humans and as members of the general environment. And as with any renaissance in science, it's typically predicated on and typically seizes upon revolutionary advances in analytical tools and diagnostic tools. So Andrew started to allude to the fact that we're actually dealing at the nano scale uh, to a greater degree than we have, ever have before. But the amazing thing is the, that we can actually visualize things with res resolutions that are un would be unthinkable about a decade ago. The first image I've got up here is from the website of Nils Walter. He's a chemistry professor here. And he's using fluorescent imaging to actually uh, 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 visualize uh, and image single molecules, and not only single molecules, but the interaction of single molecules with each other with incredible levels of resolution. Using atomic force microscopy and spectroscopies to even get even lower in resolution size, 0.1 nanometer. This is approaching, uh, you know, molecular atomic dimensions, as shown in this, uh, this uh, membrane protein uh, image shown here. And not only can we image things at that scale, but we can actually go in and do things. So this is a cover that summarizes work that uh, has been done over the past few years by Professor Kopelman in the Department of Chemistry in collaboration with our own dean, Martin Filbert, here in EHS. And uh, the work that they've been doing is concerns actually inserting nanoprobes into cells, communicating with them, interrogating them, obtaining diagnostic information from them, and then being able to actually turn them on to perform therapeutic functions at the same time. And they call this collection of nanoprobes their dynamic nanoplatform. Well, unless you, th you think that we're all about work and no play, I, I thought I would put this up here as well. These nanobombas are uh, a, one of a set of images that uh, a colleague of mine, John Hart, has put up on the web, on his website. He's from the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And uh, John is a, a consummate engineer. He's doing nano manufacturing. But he's showing us here that using materials that have nanometer dimensions, you can actually create dense layers of carbon nanotubes in this case and pattern them in any possible way imaginable. And that's the message from this term. 
So at the other end of the spectrum, we also have tools available to us now, uh, satellite-mounted remote imaging and sensing capabilities that allow us to get near-surface uh, concentrations of contaminants over length scales of hundreds or even thousands of kilometers. So we have an image here of size segregated PM 2.5 concentrations, again, near the surface, spanning 100 kilometers or more, actually, look at the, the, the whole continental United States, but with resolutions of about one kilometer. And we can do the same now with reactive gases like NO2, SO2, and ozone using similar technologies. This is a composite map in this case with a focus on the, uh, the annual changes in NO2 concentrations in eastern China. So if you think about this, the toolbox that we have available to us now as exposure sciences is pretty impressive. The distance between one nanometer, or the, the scale of, uh, the length scale between one nanometer and a thousand kilometers is 15 orders of magnitude. Okay? That's almost infathomable. So I thought I would put it in terms of time. So 15 orders of magnitude is one second in 30 million years. I think that drives it home pretty well. An amazing toolbox. Well, that's fantastic. Fantastic. So let me return to at least the micro realm for a moment. And I think of all the advances that any of us might think of that were as revolutionary as any other over the past decade, it's our ability to map and sequence the human genome now. And this has given rise to a number of derivative omics techniques and technologies. We heard about the epigenomics from Dana earlier on. These are uh, to try to probe things downstream from the genome. Talk about other biological events that are downstream. And now there's even a next generation of subdisciplines that are being generated that are looking either at specific reaction products, specific adducts, specific types of chemicals like the, the lipids, or to look at specific areas of the brain, for example, in the connectome, these sorts of things. Well, the latest addition to the omics repertoire is the exposome. So the exposome is defined there. It's the totality of environmental exposures of an individual over a lifetime. The term was coined by Christopher Wilde, who now works at the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And his paper in 2005 was the first to introduce this concept. And he predicated it on it being a complement to the genome in an attempt to study disease etiology. And over the ensuing five or 10 years, there's actually been a slowly percolating, but now a pretty strong uh, level of interest in the exposome. Uh, but still, there are only about four papers on the topic, and uh, most of them have been published either by Chris Wilde or by Steve Rappaport at UC Berkeley. In their 2010 science paper, Steve uh, Rappaport and Martin Smith from Berkeley presented this diagram as a way of sort of introducing the concept of the exposome. And they went in to try to explain that when we talk about environmental exposures in the concept of the exposome, or in, in the, under the concept of the exposome, the environment it should really be de uh, defined as the internal chemical environment of the body, everything that's not genetic, okay, that's complementary to the genome, and that the exposures are not the external exposures per se, but they're the concentrations of biologically active chemicals arising either from exposure to xenobiotics or exogenous factors, such as those listed down the left side of the slide, or the endogenous chemicals that are there normally, perhaps triggered by the exogenous exposures. But in any case, it's that integrated uh, aspect of the exposure and the internal environment that they, they want to focus on. The other sort of di discriminating feature of the exposome and, and really the distinguishing uh, feature of it is that it should be used in its ultimate form in an untargeted exploration to try to discover what the potential exposures causing disease are, rather than going in with preconceived notions. So try to find the key biomarkers, going in blind, and then go back and generate your hypotheses about how they might work, what they might be, what's the dose response, what the sources might be. So that's a critical aspect of it. Part of the rationale for this was the realization, and it's widely accepted now, that uh, most chronic disease is not predicted only by genetic factors. And a good example of that is the, or, or a couple of examples are cancer and heart disease. So the combination of cancer and heart disease accounts for more than 50% of the mortality in the United States right now. Yet only about 20% of cancers and 50% of heart disease can be predicted by genetic factors. What's left? The environment. But it turns out that with our current tools, even with fairly comprehensive epidemiologic studies, we're only able to capture a small fraction of the risk, say, due to cancers in the example I'm showing here still. 
So even when using, uh, like I said, a rather comprehensive set of potential indicators, our ability to, to, to find the exposures that are causing disease is still quite limited. So there's quite a dichotomy here in terms of the tools we use for the genome or, or omic studies and those we use for exposure studies, whereas the omic studies have high throughput met methods. They measure hundreds of millions of uh, samples every day, and they have high resolution, high precision, and high accuracy, and therefore a uh, broad scope in the, uh, in the conclusions you can draw from those. And in stark contrast, we're really in the Stone Age still in terms of expo uh, exposure measurements. We base most of our exposure estimates on questionnaires, surrogates, crude models, in some cases limited numbers of actual samples, and even when we do that, we're typically fragmented along parochial boundaries, such as what kind of medium are we talking about, what kind of disease, what kind of stressors, and we're often focusing on chemicals that are already known and already regulated. And as a result, we end up with low precision, low accuracy, low resolution, and not as much as we'd like to get out of the studies. So the concept of the exposome is thought to, to be one that might be able to help us answer these questions, address these shortcomings in uh, exposure assessment. And this diagram is from Chris Wad's latest paper, just came out this month, and it provides sort of a nice summary of uh, what this is all about. And it emphasizes the fact that the exposome, unlike many other omics endpoints, is in flux all the time and tries to address that temporal component of the exposome. Ideally, the green arrows at the bottom indicate that we'd like to collect samples, well, continuously, or at least, uh, you know, almost continuously over an entire lifetime. And this raises questions, well, really, when are we supposed to do it? How many are we supposed to uh, collect and how often? Is it feasible to do this? And right now, I think it would be argued that it's not feasible. So the fallback position that the red arrows, arrows are indicating is that we might be able to capture critical moments in uh, the development of the human, as is being done in our center here, early life exposures, so determining uh, adult onset of disease. So uh, prenatal sample, early childhood, early, early adult, and then full adult may be sufficient, but we just don't know. But these aren't the only questions we face in trying to implement the exposed zone. The other question is, what are we going to sample? Again, ideally we go in agnostically, but there, there's almost 8,000 chemicals that are recognized now, small molecules that are part of the metabolome in the human being. That's a lot of chemicals. And that raises what kind of methods are available to us to try to measure these things. And we do have sophisticated methods that are being applied to metab uh, metabolomic studies and things like this, but we have to adapt them to this problem, and we're going to need a lot of them because we're going to need lots of samples over time. And then, of course, once we generate all this data, there's going to be a huge burden to try to analyze it all, driving more in, uh, the informatics on the other side. So what are you going to do? Well, people have suggested, mainly Rappaport and Wilder are suggesting now that we, well, take some baby steps first. Leverage current prospective studies that are uh, in the process of archiving samples. Uh, Howard alluded to one earlier today, these, uh, no, the notion of biobanks, which is gaining uh, uh, traction in the field, leverage exi existing databases like NHANES and other CDC databases, and then go in and do your untargeted search and try to find these omic features that would distinguish cases from controls, and then try to generate some hypotheses from there about mechanisms, dose response, and sources. So one of the criticisms that, have been leveled, that has been leveled at this approach is the focus on the internal environment to the exclusion of the external environment. And in some of their later papers, both uh, Steve and Chris are backtracking a little bit, saying, no, 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 we never meant to ignore the external environment. Of course not. But the focus of the exposomics has to be in the body. So this comment by Annette Peters from the German uh, Institute for Environmental Health is just pointing up the fact that we can't ignore the external environment because ultimately that's where the public health interventions have to go. That's where we have to intercede, and that's certainly true. And if you think about how individualized and personalized the exposome is, what this is doing effectively is driving the need for personal monitoring, something those of us who work in the occupational environment are pretty familiar with. Well, coincidentally, I think, there's been another revolution going on in the electronics world that goes by one of, or various names that are such as those lift, uh, listed here. And in fact, here's an example of a technology that has been developed explicitly to allow for what's called ubiquitous or participatory sensing. This is essentially equipping the general population with sensors and communication devices to allow them to do their, their own sampling of themselves and then tell their friends about it and actually put it up on the web and, and share the information. Well, that's a tremendous resource that we could take advantage of, right? <laughs> So this company, Sensaris, has, has produced a set now, or a series of uh, devices called SensePods, and you're seeing 
them up uh, on the upper left there on the uh, wrist of a person. It contains uh, a modular set of uh, chemical sensors and uh, sensors for physical quantities like temperature, humidity, and noise. They have other modules available. And they have a, then a cell phone app that allows the data to be downloaded and then uploaded to the, to the web for sharing with other people and created basically a network of uh, sensor information. So you can get a multi-parameter exposure map, such as shown uh, uh, conceptually right there, of time, space, and exposure to a bunch of chemicals. Okay? And what if we could add heart rate? And people are working now on personal heart rate monitors or respiration monitors to add that element to the exposure assessment tool. Fantastic, right? One of the problems, though, is that the kinds of sensors or kinds of chemicals for which there are sensors available that are small enough to fit in a cell phone are relatively limited, limited to reactive gases and, and, and the like. And so I had to take just one moment to tell you about the research, we're, the research we're doing in our group to focus on a much more difficult problem, which is monitoring VOCs in complex mixtures. So we've been working uh, trying to make micro-machined uh, systems out of silicon that employ uh, various different components that uh, uh, are collectively referred to uh, generally as micro-gas chromatographs. So off to the left here, you're seeing a printed circuit board uh, with some components on it that comprise our microsystem. Uh, and the problem we were uh, addressing most recently and have succeeded in addressing is one that's referred to as vapor intrusion. So we went out to a Superfund site in Utah near Hill Air Force Base where they've had a groundwater contamination problem with TCE for many years. And it's a plume now that is uh, emanating out into the re uh, residential neighborhoods surrounding the, uh, the Air Force Base. And we were able to access a house and uh, put a couple of our prototypes inside to measure TCE concentrations at extremely low levels, part per trillion levels here, in the, in the presence of up to 50 or actually 65 interfering compounds that we documented. And the, the upper curve there shows you the kinds of uh, uh, profiles we can get uh, walking around the house trying to measure the uh, concentrations of TCE and find the location of the uh, source of the TCE in the house. And then I've included a chromatogram there. We use a sensor array, so we get four outputs with, uh, uh, you can see a bunch of peaks there, and we were able to tease out the TCE from them. So that's just a quick introduction to our work. And it's not too uh, difficult to then extend this notion of doing personalized sensing out to this ubiquitous net network idea where you have several measures that you're collecting on your body, both of exposure as well as perhaps physiological factors, perhaps uh, through GPS systems link with fixed sensor networks and then have, say, an interim analysis and then a base station where you could do the uh, more sophisticated analysis of the data. So getting back to my original concept that exposure science is a sort of a unifying theme, I think it is really. And, it's, and there's some new things going on, just as, as I've talked about here, that actually will foster uh, uh, the uh, uh, components of environmental health sciences working together. But as was also alluded to earlier on, I think this is also an opportunity, if not a demand for us, to expand the partners that we work with and work more with engineers to try to develop some of these sensor systems, do more work with biomedicine, social scientists, which we're already doing to some extent, but I think it's going to be driven even further by the availability of, the, of these technologies. And then informatics, of course, will figure very large. And with that, I'm done. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>